And I want to start before everything, so to facilitate following the panel and the discussions, you can s access all the presentations when you are using this tiny URL. It's DH panel, so you can just either write it down or just put it there. And it's just a Google folder. Of course, then we will have our uh, presentations and auto and everything. But right now, you can just follow all the presentations uh, there. Yeah, tinyurl.com dh panel. So, uh, <laughs> hello again. So, my name is Tomasz Merla. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in, at the Institute of Literary Research Project Academy of Sciences, but we are known as IBL PAN. Uh, don't ask why. And together with my colleague Wojtek Malinek, we are co-chairs of Bibliographical Data Working Group at Daria Eric. Uh, and so we will be making an introduction to the panel and then moderating the panel today for you. So the panel's program looks like that. We have this introduction, so we go through the topic overview, uh, and then I will introduce briefly the panelists. Then we have the presentations by panelists and the short discussions between them, and then we open the discussion uh, for you and for whoever is online if they wish to comment or ask a question. Right. So a couple of words about uh, our working group. So our working group, it was established in 2018, 2019. And so what we aim to do is to foster co cooperation between all parties involved in Bibio data life cycles, so curators, researchers, data officers, scientists, and those who represent different research methodologies, such as cultural analytics, bibliometrics, book history, etc. And how we define and what we mean by bibliographical data is a very broad metadata-inspired uh, um, definition of bibliographical data or structure information about the form, content, and context of documents in any form or medium. Although, as our name indicates, we are more focused on the textual content. So our group has 30, 30, 45 members, circa, from 15 countries. We did already uh, quite a number of workshops, and when you access our presentations, all the workshops uh, are recorded and freely available, so you can just watch them, or you can also access our, um, our outputs on Zenodo and on YouTube, and get in touch with us on Twitter. So what we've been working on, and now transitioning to today's topic of the of the panel, so we've been, what we've been working on in the recent couple of years is on understanding how the biographical data landscape in the humanities looks like. We have a report about this. It looks like that, and you can access it on Zenodo. You can watch it on YouTube in a shorter version, so if you don't want to read it. And we have a copy with us. I know that people are resistant, resisting getting copies of things, but they are here. So you can, you can take them with you. And then we have a detailed discussion of uh, this geographical data landscape. So very briefly, what we have found is that the geographical data landscape for the humanities is a very region complex um, ecosystem of stakeholders who register cultural and scientific uh, phenomena through metadata. And this consists of union catalogs, bibliographies, library catalogs, academic repositories, CRIS systems, citation indexes, metadata aggregators, social network information services, etc. And on the other hand, we also have a growing trend to produce knowledge based on metadata, and various stakeholders are involved in that. Services, but also, of course, researchers representing diverse methods and approaches. So, our findings are that mm, this biographical data landscape has a huge potential because of large amounts of metadata available, diverse interest, and relative accessibility to metadata as compared to full text, for example, of contemporary uh, outputs. But there are challenges that we think we need to face together as a community, as a network. So, and those challenges are the barriers between 
video data resources originating from different uh, sectors, for example, like from culture sector and infrastructures and scientific ones, or from public and private actors. And on the other hand, we have barriers between different dis disciplines and research approaches. As I mentioned before, we have bibliometrics, book history, cultural analytics, and so on. And those are the challenges that we invite you to discuss today. And we invite you to discuss solutions to these challenges through four presentations and through the panel discussion. So we want to focus today on those four key areas that we deem to be um, key for addressing these challenges. And these are the bibliographic data sciences, bibliographic data science, and multidisciplinary uh, dimension of um, bibliographic data science. Secondly, open science and the need to prepare to create uh, open metadata resources tailored for the needs of the humanities. Uh, third, uh, documentation of bibliographic resources that is standardized and common. And finally, uh, connecting different resources through linked open data. Uh, so, notification of bibliographic data resources. So, we invite you to discuss these solutions today uh, with us. So, the people that will help us to discuss those, uh, those uh, solutions are, um, and some of them are with us today, some of them couldn't be here, and so we only have one person presenting. So uh, the opportunities and challenges for bibliographical data science will be was prepared by Agnieszka Karlinska and Miko Tolon, and Miko is with us here. Uh, the building the humanities citation in a case in point for open bibliodata was prepared by Matteo Romanello and Silvio Peroni and Giovanni Colavica, who is with us today. Um, Documentation of biodata resources was prepared by Jakub Łubocki, Dorota Siwecka, and Naned Riesler Pipka, and Naned and Dorota are with us and will be presenting. And bibliodata notification using free software was prepared by Penny Labropoulou and Christian Kles and David Lindemann, and David is with us and will be presenting. So, uh, the moderator will be Wojtek Marinek, my co chair, and I give the floor to him. Okay, good morning from me also. I will be quite fast. I do not need to introduce myself and I will, I will directly pass the word to Miko Tolonen who will uh, give his presentation on bibliodata research. So Miko, please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna use this microphone instead of this other. Do you have the clicker? Ah, sorry, I took it with me. Thank you. It's okay. So, good morning. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, opportunities and challenges in bibliographical data science. So, first, let's try to define a little bit what we mean by bibliographical data science. So, the idea there, uh, we've written a paper, sort of a defining what it means, but, but the idea is that we have a systematic approach towards bibliographic data. So both research use, enhancement, and new creation of new bibliodata. So, so that's the idea. And then that it's done in a systematic way. And data science is also present in a sense that we have uh, new methodologies. AI is very much present. And the way that I see it, it's what we are trying to do in all of our work with bibliodata, why we need so many stakeholders is that it's kind of like this ever, never ending dance between unstructured and structured data. So a lot of the, there, there's been for decades kind of a little bit maybe um, naive ideas what machine learning can do with unstructured data that we could do without having structured data in a sense of metadata that is controlled uh, by professionals, which is very much what we need, so the classical bibliographical data approach, but then we are able to do all kinds of new things with unstructured data. So my claim, and what I want to say, talk to you today, is that we really need a researcher-based infrastructural framework where we combine the kind of classic metadata-based workflows and then cutting-edge uh, AI. 
So I'm going to give you a couple different examples of creation or just mention, basically I don't have that much time, uh, but creation of new bibliographical data based on unstructured data. So examples will be text reuse and then also uh, subject topics, how, how those can be created anew. Uh, and then also looking at translations with cross-lingual transformer models and then extracting visual elements from books, uh, which is a very important way of thinking about new bibliographical data. So all of these are work that my, my own research group is doing. Uh, and if you want to know more about the cases, I don't have time to go into details. Uh, I can give you some papers that you can read afterwards. Text reuse, so thinking about overlaps between books. This is something that a whole lot of people are working on when we have these massive data sets of 100 years, a couple hundred thousand books. So it's a very, if we think about intertextuality, that's an incredibly good way of thinking about a bond between different uh, bibliographic objects. So if there's textual overlap, there's clearly some kind of a, a special bond. But then the question is, okay, we can study these, we can, uh, we've been building interfaces, many others have uh, doing that same thing, but what do we think about that in terms of structured data? So if we think about different editions, different kinds of uh, uh, object, print objects, and how they relate to each other, the text reuse is definitely one place where we can think of creating some new structured data, just to mention that as a case. Another one is that what we've been in my group thinking is that if we think about genres or subject topics, uh, we get a bibliographic object and we want to say that that whole book is, for example, of particular genre or many genres. But what we can do with AI these days is that we can look at sequential change within the book. So we can fairly well do automated way of taking different sections of the book and looking at what genres they are and how they change. So again, completely new way of thinking about uh, structured data when this is then taken into the form that once we have the automated way of dealing with the unstructured data and then creating new uh, bibliographic structured data out of that. Another thing, this is very, very exciting, is that the semantic um, mapping of, of sort of cross-lingual uh, transformer-based models uh, gives us a possibility of looking at translations in a whole new way. So a little bit in the same way that we can look at uh, uh, textual overlaps, we can also start mapping translations. And not only full translations, but in an automated way, looking at s smaller snippets or, or shorter passages of translations and then uh, taking that as a, again, new form of structured data. Very exciting, in my opinion, that, that we can sort of uh, look at the composition of translations or books and how they borrow from other language sources in a, in a new way. Works surprisingly well with the new large language models. And then also, as a book historian, visual elements and what we can do by extracting uh, visual elements from different, different uh, books and, and then start classifying them and combining that information to printer and publisher information gives us a whole new way of thinking about uh, what kind of uh, information are we doing in a structured way once the sort of a lower process of using the AI and, and doing the clusters starts to work. And, and that's also the point where we really need interaction between different domain expertise. So the librarians obviously have a very good way of thinking how to structure the data, but then uh, the data science and humanities research parts can bring new ways of thinking about it. So then collaborating and thinking about it together is very much what we obviously would like to do. So my claim is that what we create when we think like this, so we don't think that the domains need to be tied, and we don't think that the AI, for example, the structured, unstructured data is going to overtake the, the way that we are dealing with the sort of classical way of doing things. 
So we create a kind of virtuous cycle. We harmonize the bibliographic data. We take that when we are working with full data sources. People might think that they don't need it. They always need it. Metadata is always needed. You can't escape it. But also then we are taking the full text, for example, and enriching the bibliographical data. The text reuse and information coming from there and thinking about additions and how they are mapped is a, is a very clear idea how things are feeding back, for example, to the way that Ferber model, for example, is developed. And then also what is red, on red here, I think is very important so that we don't need perfect data because the data will never be perfect. There is that ongoing, never-ending dance that, that is happening. So we need to accept it and we need to be uh, ad agile in a way. So when is data good enough? It's when it's good enough when it's, we can answer in a scientific way the kind of research questions that we are asking. And that's the main point, for me at least. And the challenge is then when we are, for example, building with this dynamic duo, our uh, sort of bibliographic data working group and infrastructure also, is that we need to avoid things to become very, very heavy and difficult. So patience and building things, the building of the community, people coming together from different aspects and being able to do that kind of that small cases are scaled up when they make sense. That, that's the kind of work that we need to do, be doing. And also then, uh, if we want to use AI and we don't have the data available, that's, we can't do anything. So, so that's something where we would need to push, push different sides of uh, really the boring old idea of digitization. Where is the money coming from? So that's still an issue, obviously, for, for the research. I think I'll end here. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Miko, very much for your presentation, and we will start a short discussion among the panelists, so surprisingly, maybe I will start with the first question, if I may. Do you uh, want me to stand here or go and sit? How do you prefer, I... or how do our guests prefer, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if I can ask, okay, go ahead. Yeah. you were thinking or you were uh, talking about, uh, you know, organizing a general European infrastructure for uh, for a shared bibliodata, but currently it is mostly the case that we have uh, various different sets of individual databases processed in different institutions and so on. Uh, what do you expect from uh, the curators to provide for you that you would be able to provide a, or conduct a good research on bibliodata? What are the most important issues the curators should concentrate on? Yeah, I. I, I think that, I mean, like I said, that if we are building, I mean, that, that, that the community comes together, I mean, that, that there is a discussion, I mean, that there are ongoing workflows all the time. And, and then if we are able to negotiate and understand that, okay, these people are trying to do this type of thing, and here they are going towards this direction. So we have some kind of ongoing processes, let's say, from the library side that, that are going, we didn't realize that, but here's a mutual way of, of looking at things and taking things towards the right direction. So just enabling that first, and, and also then that there is a, is a sense of um, that, that the motivation is to actually share things uh, when it's possible, to open it up. I mean, that, that we, there's often, uh, we've been struggling with things, such things that, that, that libraries uh, are, if they can't, if something can't be opened up uh, for the entire community, so then there could be like some kind of a research collaboration where, where at least some of the data is shared. And in the same way that the method basis, we need to still enhance things and, and take those forward. But the only way to do it is that when we have the community where, where people are actually willing, wanting to, to come together. And I, I think that, for example, here, that as many countries as we have in this bibliodata process and from all the actors from different sides, I mean, that, that, that's the, what takes things forward. And then obviously, I mean, that there are other Daria, Clarin, other infrastructures that are there for the humanities and taking advantage of those so that not everything always has to be done in one project. I, I think understanding that is, is the main thing. 
Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Any other comment, remark from the panelists? Yeah, Dorota. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, maybe it's just more the comment than the question, but uh, you mentioned libraries and AI, and I know that in many countries, like library has a pretty low status in society. So maybe you think that, uh, you know, connecting AI and bibliotheca data, data science with libraries would increase this uh, society status for libraries? Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I, I think that the more that we are working, uh, well, first of all, of course, bibliotheca data is the best kind of data. People just need to understand it. But, 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 but the, 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 the boundaries between if we think about the world as such, uh, metadata is everywhere, for example. So, so that it, you can't escape it. And, 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 and the way that, that if we are able also to build the brand in the right kind of way, that we are really using AI in a way, in the systematic way of using it. There's a lot of companies who there, out there who give a promise that, well, we're going to solve all your problems in two seconds. The problem that was given 20 years ago, the problems are still here, even when the methods are, are going forward. So it's not about the availability of the tools, it's the systematic use. So, so that, that that's, I mean, that, that we could also, I mean, benefit quite a bit. Libraries are the most incredible infrastructure. I mean, I think, I mean, that how systematic many of the things are there compared to, to looking at uh, uh, many other sides uh, of, of the society where we live in. But yeah, agreed. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Miko. And maybe with respect to the time, I would like to invite Giovanni for his speech. And Giovanni will introduce us a presentation entitled Building the Humanity Citation Index. So, Giovanni, please, floor is yours. Is this one? <coughs> okay, oh, sorry. Hi, good morning. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm presenting also on behalf of Matteo and, uh, and Silvio, um, my colleagues. So on the Humanities Citation Index, so I think it's, it's very fitting that you know, it comes after Miko's presentation because it will echo quite a few of the points that is just made. Um, I shall disclose as well that this idea of the Humanities Citation Index is still very much an idea. It's more like a vision. So I'll, I'll pitch that to you. There are some components out there, but Definitely not a tool that we can already use, but we will get there, hopefully. So uh, what is a Humanities Citation Index and why a Humanities Citation Index? We just said, you know, libraries are kind of amazing repositories of uh, information, in particular in the humanities. Uh, so the way we look at the literature is still primarily going to the library, looking at the catalog. Yeah? So, this is a great process, it's fine, nothing wrong with it, except that it's quite slow, and it's also difficult to make it systematic. Uh, second point is that um, you might or might not know, but actually, on average, at least half of the citations that you can find in humanities literature are not to published material, but to primary sources of any shape and form. And those are not in the library. They're outside, they might be in an archive, they might be in a museum, they might be elsewhere. So there are many, many potential links that are missing that we cannot activate, we cannot use if we are searching for literature and for those connections. And indeed, this is very much why um, you know, existing citation indexes, uh, you have Google Scholar, but there are many, many more, uh, to the extent that I know, are not very widely used in the humanities, and essentially because they lack coverage, and they lack a lot of the information that is necessary in the humanities. So you can do a search, but you will never be sure to find everything that you need that is relevant to your query. So this is the idea of a humanities citation index. It's done properly in view of the use cases and requirements of humanists. Here. Um, but first, let me stress a little bit more about the current limitation, let's say the challenges of building such a humanity citation index that are many. Um, by the way, everything of, about this vision and what I will be discussing is published in this journal article that you can find in open access if you want to know more. 
so the current limitations and, and challenges that we have is the um, lack of appropriate coverage that I just mentioned. This is much, uh, much bigger issue than what we might think because different disciplines have entirely different uh, coverage. Uh, coverage over time varies a lot. So the more you go back in time, the less information you can find. Um, publication typologies, like pretty much all citation indices, commercial or otherwise that are out there, they primarily focus on journal articles. But of course, in the humanities, we have books, we have edited volumes and what have you. Um, citation typology, so I mentioned primary sources before. That's, that's very important and entirely missing. Um, so there is no index that is comprehensive enough to be used. This is the situation since many, many years. I mean, there is a, a, an abundant literature that discusses the problem, but we are still there. So what do we think are the requirements that the Humanities Citation Index, or uh, UC for short, should have? First of all, it should be very comprehensive in uh, source coverage. Uh, so we think that um, many languages should be covered, not just English, of course, because a lot of the literature is in national languages. Um, all the publication typologies that might be of interest and citation typologies as well. It should have chronological depth. So this assumption that is made in many citation indices, uh, it stands for many sciences that you essentially primarily need the most recent developments. You know, there is this idea of frontier of the research makes uh, older publications rapidly outdated doesn't really apply in the humanities. Yeah? So we still need to have chronological depth, therefore digitization and then information extraction and whatever. Um, we also think it's important to have context. Now, this has to do with the way um, sources are um, cited in humanities literature, usually with much more information surrounding it uh, that helps the interpretation of so why a citation was made what was its purpose, what role that source or publication plays in the citing publication. You know, it might be a very long footnote, for example, explaining that. So context would be nice to have. Uh, and finally, we think it should be collection driven. Now, this is a very important point because it goes in the direction of how actually can we build such a, a humanity citation index. So what do we mean by collection driven is to have ideally many, even small scale, but um, coherent um, collections that are coherent in terms of their contents that are processed and added to the index at the same time. Now, if you don't do that, you end up essentially replicating the issues that I just mentioned because you don't have comprehensive coverage, so no one can start using it. It's better to have someone starting using it, their own bunch of literature that they care about than trying to do everything at the same time. Um, we also think there are some preconditions that are a bit beyond the Humanity Citation Index and are necessary to have in order to even start building it and maintaining and sustaining it. Uh, so the first and one of the most important ones is licensing. Uh, so it's, it's a big issue to access these materials, the full text of publications, because they are usually under copyright. So this, uh, we think, is something that Publishers in the humanities still have to do some catching up in terms of understanding because in, in other domains, this is very standard. So you, you, you provide access to uh, indices because you want your publications to be indexed. Yeah? So this is not yet there in most uh, humanities publishers. Uh, you need to have a very good documentation, so metadata, essentially, um, shared in, you know, in shared format, in shared standards that you can reuse relatively seamlessly. Um, you need persistent identifiers. The whole business is to create uh, a network of citations, so you really need to be able to identify every resource. And ideally, you, did, you need everything you know, provided through uh, APIs, so programmatically, in a way that you can harvest and then reuse. Um, so I, I, you probably know this is uh, still not there, uh, by far and large, and it's contextual, again. So there are some challenges at that level as well. Um, a little add-on there on the issue of coverage. Um, I just wanted to, to show you how severe that issue is in existing 
uh, citation indices and uh, for that matter catalogs or meta catalogs. So recently did uh, one of these small case, uh, small scale uh, projects that we do to build the humanity citation index with uh, Brill, the publisher. And we worked on their um, catalog uh, on classics. So a few thousand monographs on classics. And we mined, extracted all the references and tried to build a citation index out of that. So in, in the bibliography, in the list of references. And we found that only about 40% of those references could find a match in Google Books or Crossref. I'm not talking about primary source. I'm only talking about a list of references in the bibliography. So you see, like, a lot is missing, even in these allegedly very comprehensive existing resources. So to conclude, what do we have in mind in terms of architecture? It's a little bit more technical, but um, we think it's an interesting design. So we, we think we need to be very modular and build independent things that are able to talk to each other very much, you know, in IIIF fashion, if you like. So at the very beginning, we have a data collection layer. And here we are really in the domain, even in premises, possibly, of libraries that have their own catalog, their own digital library. They do digitization, or they have the uh, literature. Um, and they might want to keep it, you know? So make it available for processing, but keep it internally. Uh, then these institutional databases should um, be able to speak, and vice versa, with a data federation layer, what we call a data federation layer. So there, imagine huge triple stores that contain metadata and citation data. And that's maybe where we are most advanced, thanks to uh, a big project at the University of Bologna, Silvio Peroni's the PI, which is called Open Citations. And if you don't know about it, it's interesting to look it up. Uh, and it's exactly that. Right? It's, a, it's a repository of citations. Uh, thirdly, we have a service layer where we imagine having uh, different bots, different agents, uh, some machine learning to do several things. So harvesting data, uh, deduplication, big issue, uh, enrichment, and what have you. And finally, we have applications. So applications could be, of course, like a citation index, like Google Scholar, or something equivalent, or other things. And with this architecture, provided that the standards are there to communicate uh, among layers, then you can imagine that different actors, different players, can take care of different components. And hopefully that will make it sustainable. So that's a bit the idea. Uh, where are we with this? Um, very much at the beginning. So we did uh, several of those small uh, scale projects that Miko was also mentioning. Uh, we're very instrumental in understanding a little bit more challenges and how to design it. Uh, as I mentioned, some components are there like open citations, but then, you know, we, we need to get going uh, and keep doing this small scale project to start growing it, essentially. And if you're interested, please get in touch, of course. Very happy to talk about it, and thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, Giovanni. Any question from the panelists? Yeah, David? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Germany. I have a question about the citation extraction process. This is usually done now using machine learning backed tools, now where you need large amounts of training data. So if Google or ResearchGate are using these tools, they don't share their training data, right? Uh, will this be different in, in our project, or is, could, should, should we, shouldn't we regard this kind of training data as part of what we call open bibliodata? Yeah, so thank you very much for the question. I think, uh, so there is a good news in the sense that uh, uh, citation extraction and citation parsing uh, works relatively well on most sources. I mean, it needs some adaptation, but it works relatively well. Also with open uh, models. So it's something that we can do. We're relatively confident about that. Um, but on the other hand, about open uh, open data, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the main obstacles that we have in this kind of, building this kind of infrastructure. So a lot is not open. And um, we definitely think that everything should be, should be shared openly. 
uh, not just put there in the open, but also properly documented and also shared in a format and in such a way that can be easily reused. So that, of course, includes also annotated data that will be instrumental in citation extraction. Yeah, by all means. Okay, thank you very much, Giovanni. Maybe with respect to the time, I would like yeah. to thank you and invite Dorota for her presentation on documentation of bibliodata resources. Good morning, and thank you that I can be here. This is my first DH uh, conference, and I am glad that I can be here. Uh, so um, in this part of this panel, uh, we would like to focus on documentation concerning bibliographical uh, databases. So that's uh, another different uh, approach to bibliographical databases yes, than uh, we've heard before. And um, so uh, we think that you know, creating, maintaining, providing access to resources of bibliographical nature is uh, proving to be insufficient uh, for the average user um, because even if we have uh, the best constructed bibliographical database and use it, we are using uh, international standards and open license and um, IPI, uh, it turns out to be uh, moderately useful when its description of this database is lacking for a user. Yeah? And um, a lack of uh, documentation and proper user-friendly documentation uh, containing basic information on, for example, bibliographic, the methodology of creating this bibliographical database uh, affects many factors. For example, the user's answers um, and awareness of the level of the relevancy and completeness of the obtained results. If I don't know what is in the database exactly, because I don't know the methodology of creating this database, how can I know that my results of my research that I made with those bibliodata are true? You know? So um, this is the one thing that uh, we have a user that needs a good documentation, a user-friendly documentation. Yeah? This is not the documentation that we are talking about the very technical things like metadata standards. Of course, it's also important to give him this information, but um, probably he would like to also have another things. And uh, we think also that this is important in the, in the context of verification of data because we've heard that we can use bibliodata to make a research project. So now bibliodata are also a research data. So we have to also make sure that they are fair, mostly to the air, that they are reusable. If we want them to be reusable, then the user has to know what exactly is inside of this database. What kind of data, data, uh, data I have in this and what, can I, what kind of question I can ask if I do have those data. Yeah? Uh, so what does user-friendly documentation entail in our opinions? So first of all, we think that it should include basic information of the methodology of creating bibliographical data sets. And uh, secondly, I think it would be also great to get to know your user group uh, before creating documentation. So you have to think about the user, who exactly is going to use your bibliodata, and then adjust your documentation a little bit at least for those users. And uh, we have to also uh, remember that um, uh, researchers that are using bibliodata usually need more explanation regarding the expected information like uh, scope and coverage of the bibliodata, the standards, formats, uh, or provided tools for analysis uh, because uh, there are not only librarians yeah, who use this bibliodata anymore. We have also researchers and they usually don't know what Mark 21 is or Dublin Core. 
So, of course, we have to provide him information that we use, for example, Mark 21. And then he can search for a documentation about the standard or we can provide him information about the standard. Yeah? He would like to know if uh, I have a Biblio data in the database, what period it is covered in this database. Yeah? So uh, we assume that to get to the top of the pyramid, so to prepare the international recommendation, it would be a good idea for the database providers um, and those recommendations should take into account the user's point of view. So what do we need to achieve that? Um, for also, we think we need uh, different stakeholders collaboration like librarians, researchers, metadata experts and database uh, providers. Uh, firstly, to find the existing, uh, existing uh, recommendations already. Uh, from different countries, because, for example, I know that there are some recommendations in Poland, but I don't know how does it look like in France or in German and so on. So probably there are some recommendations in many languages. So I think this international collaboration is quite important here. Um, and uh, for those existing recommendations, we created a Zotero group, uh, and it's free open. So if you would like to add an information about uh, the publications or resources that are concerning the documentation, the description of database, uh, bibliographical databases, uh, you are welcome to add it. Some of them are already there. And uh, because, um, in my opinion, the documentation for a bibliographical database um, has a very similar role that the introduction to the printed bibliographic has, uh, then I think it's also important to collect the publication that concerns uh, this, um, how to make a printed bibliography. Yeah, because they also make some um, information about how to uh, explain the user in the um, introduction what exactly is inside the bibliography. And um, why the collaboration is also needed is uh, because when you are looking for uh, those publications uh, in cat library catalogs or bibliographical databases and you put uh, the search uh, like method bibliography methodology, you usually get uh, the publications about how to prepare uh, references for your publications or annotated bibliography. There are no publications or there are uh, there is a huge amount of those kind of publications, but it's really hard to get the publication that actually says how to prepare a bibliographical database, how to prepare the correct bibliography in a printed form. Yeah, that's why I think the collaboration is pretty important. Yeah? Uh, so we plan it to, to work well, step one would be collect the full text of the, those publications, translation them uh, to English if it's uh, going to be needed. And uh, we are looking also for uh, a collaboration with those of you who would like to uh, make a, a studies about the research needs, uh, users' needs, needs. And the step two would be the analysis of this publication and extract the basic common elements. So we assume for now that uh, from among those elements, there will be like uh, scope, the coverage, uh, the source of information of uh, bibliodata, the structure, use metadata model, licenses, possibilities of reuse. So those are the information that user needs in this documentation. And we also think that it would be a good idea uh, to put in those recommendations also the best practice examples so already existing databases that has a good documentation. So the next step would be creating the international guidelines for bibliodata providers. And also we are thinking about making a template uh, of database description for other bibliodata providers. Uh, and at the end, uh, uh, I think it's good to may say something about the uh, possible benefits of the recommendation and the template. So probably it would be easier to uh, make a comparison be 
between bibliographic databases, mostly for the researchers, which database I would like to use because I know already what's inside of it. So it would be easier also to select the right, uh, the right database for the research and maybe this template would provide us uh, or get us to creating a register of European bibliographic databases for humanities. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, Dorota, for your talk. Any question? Thanks. Um, so developing the kind of comprehensive guidelines for the bibliographic data providers, that's one thing. But then there's the other part, which is how do you think that the providers we will be kind of persuaded actually to use them? Yeah, I think this is a really good question and it would be really tough. <laughs> to, to do it. I think that um, one thing is for sure the translation of this recommendation to other languages because I can see like Polish language is not a common language like English yeah, or German or, or Spanish. So mostly if uh, we have like in Poland some uh, biblio data providers, they usually don't care of documentation. They are even not uh, aware that people would like have a documentation and what exactly should be there. And mostly the language is also a problem. So if those recommendations would be translated into other languages, I think it would be easier to convince people. And maybe if you have any other um, ideas, I would be glad to hear how <laughs> uh, to make it more um, usable, yeah, this, this uh, recommendation, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dorota. And maybe I will introduce David, who will have the last speech of our panel, and it will be the speech entitled Bibliodata Lodification with Use of a Free Software. So, David, please, floor is yours. And now, can you just help me to find this? Out of here, no? Yeah, hello, I'm David. <clears throat> I'm presenting this also on uh, behalf of my colleagues Penny and Christiane. And our work is about uh, describing, implementing and providing tools related to uh, lotification work workflows available to anybody. So, um, what we take as biblia data is not only the typical publication metadata. We shall have uh, tools or solutions that are as flexible as to uh, include uh, additional metadata generated by, um, by methods as um, described before by my colleagues, you know, such as citation relations or other, other data extracted from full texts. And of course, linked open data meets with the FAIR principles and uh, we shall be com compatible um, to the semantic web, which I explain now in more detail. We have, uh, in, the, in the last decades, there are <coughs> several conceptual models and ontologies um, been developed uh, for uh, bibliodata. We have the FERBER, which is now part of the, a larger model, which is the library reference uh, model, or LR LRM. We have the Library of Congress's BibFrame, and we have the bibliographic ontology Bibo. We have not, uh, we now don't have the time to elaborate on this in detail, but you may uh, find more information in these links or ask us later. Then in the different countries, and now here we list just three countries where um, bibliodata lodification projects have been carried out, just as examples. Some of them involve uh, Wikibase and Wikidata. And this is, in fact, what uh, we are proposing because the use cases we have been working on so far, they had a strong preference in being compatible to Wikidata. Yeah? Uh, mainly because uh, of the Wikidata identify identifiers for any kind of entity, but also because they want to include uh, their, their own uh, identifiers as external ID property in Wikidata. Hmm? And also, um, if you look, for example, at the Open Citations project, there it is now enabled that you are included in the Open Citations graph 
if you don't have a DOI to DOI citation link, but a Wikidata ID to Wikidata ID citation link, which is very useful for, um, for projects that don't have uh, many funding, don't have much funding, no. Uh, for example, we are working on, um, uh, on Basque, um, uh, uh, scientific opera in Basque language, and there we won't pay one dollar for a DOI for every older public publication we want to include in our citation index. No? So this is, this is about democracy, no? or being open to, to just anybody who wants to take part in these um, efforts. So uh, related to, uh, to Wikidata, there are um, several uh, open, and op open source and free tools. You might find out uh, what this is about clicking on these links. And what we are proposing in the work workflows we have been developing or implementing on special use cases so far is that we first send our data to a known Wikibase instance which has uh, several advantages uh, compared to working directly with uh, Wikidata. Uh, if you don't know Wikibase, it is like an empty Wikidata for you, no? uh, which uh, you fill with your content, and uh, as soon as your content reaches a stage um, where you, you want it to reach, then you may send it to Wikidata or federate it with Wikidata. And moreover, it is now possible to have a Wikibase instance for free hosted by Wikimedia Germany, which is the Wikibase cloud. Okay, so um, there are several advantages of using a known Wikibase. Um, so uh, some of them are listed here. No? You can have your own user community or your student assistance group or whoever you want to engage in your project and don't mix it with the uh, Wikidata community. You can implement your own uh, data model and this, this can be ad hoc without checking how things are done on Wikidata. Uh, you can also include properties that, which, are, which are not there or at the moment not there so, so you can work on your own and later map it to Wikidata and also, of course, if you have noisy data, you don't want to pollute the main Wikidata with your noisy stuff uh, before having curated it on your own instance. So, so far we have been working on three different use cases uh, related to this. First use case was in the framework of the Alexis project uh, three years ago. Uh, where we developed a workflow for exporting publication metadata from Zotero and import it into Wikibase. And there we did some more, uh, some, some more stuff. Um, we uh, processed full texts and uh, did keyword indexation. So we also uh, are able to add these keywords to our uh, metadata as uh, described on the Wikibase. Hmm. Uh, the second project was a custom relational database, um, and the third one is about MARC XML notification. I have now some slides which describe these in detail. So the first one was uh, Zotero. Uh, we sent the publication metadata to Wikibase and then link the uh, literals for, uh, for example, person names or place names to entities using OpenRefine, which we connect to our own Wikibase. Hmm. The second use case was a, a typical tabular um, database that we converted to this graph structure. And the third one is a MARC XML data set, in this case uh, the Czech uh, literary bibliography, which is uh, worked on at the at Vojtex institution. And uh, yeah, here we managed to to convert uh, a larger test set of items to Wikibase format, but uh, this mark is more complicated, and not only because it's a complicated model, but also because we know that in different institutions they use mark in a different way. So in this case, it will be more complicated, complicated to come up with a generic solution than in the case of Zotero. So, so far what we have done, we have uh, converted but publication metadata and other kinds of bibliodata to Wikibase format. And um, our scripts that have done these jobs so, uh, have been uh, 
generated in the moment and use case specific. So the next step will be to become more generic. So we are very interested in uh, connecting to other researchers who are, who are interested in, uh, for example, the Zotero pipeline or also the Mark XML effort. And this is this is what we uh, what we are planning to work on in the next years in the framework of this uh, working group. So if you are interested, please contact us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, David, for your presentation. Maybe I will pose the first question. Uh, as you were talking about uh, Biblio data and uh, Wikidata, basically the Wikidata is the ocean of the data, and you can enrich bibliographical data with plenty of other information about the author, source documents, and so on. Where do you see the borders between bibliographical data and, let's say, the other types of the data? Yeah, actually, <clears throat> The good thing about um, connecting your bibliodata to Wikidata is that you lose these borders. Now you can have a very strange queries. Now you can include any other statement that is made about your entity in your in the Sparkle query. So you can you can you can combine knowledge, uh, bibliodata knowledge, with other kind of knowledge. Now relate relate your your bibliographic data with uh, geographical information or information about the the persons uh, you are in front. So uh, this is it's just about um, breaking these, these borders, no? Okay, perfect, thanks. Any other question? Well, continuing a little bit on this, that the oldest joke in bibliography is that Mark 21 is gonna die, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, when you look at the future, do you see Wikidata kind of being the new Mark 21 that never dies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not working in a library, but I know that Mark is a, um, a, a model for catalogs, no? for library catalogs. And um, yesterday I had a conversation with one colleague from Can Canada. Uh, she told me that uh, there is a library that has now the whole library catalog on a wiki base. So um, this is interesting. Um, in Germany, I know that they are working about uh, linked data in libraries for decades, but there isn't a library catalog uh, based on that. They are still working with Mark. So um, it is possible and it makes sense, but um, yeah, you would have to convince the libraries, which are sometimes a bit slow in adapting new technologies. Um, the, the mark is far from ideal, of course, because, it, for example, because in every institution they use it in a different way, no? So for my conversion task, I would uh, have to speak in detail with the, uh, with the catalog people from that institution uh, to know how they use it. Um, yeah, so it's a good idea to use linked data, and libraries do that, but for catalogs, I think, uh, there are a few examples, not more at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, David. And maybe with this answer, we will close the first session of our, of our panel. So I would like to thank all of the panelists for their presentations and for their questions. And now the floor is open for the questions for the audience. So if there is any question, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah. The mic is coming from the left side, so please. Thanks. No, wonderful panel. Thanks, everybody. Um, I have a question for Mikko and maybe also David. Um, so I fully embrace the vision, and I, I agree that Bibliodata is very useful for a lot of research. Uh, but then, at some point, when it comes to content, we are reaching the limit, I think. And then your example about uh, like a genre that you can assign to different parts of, of, of a text, of a document, it could be an example of this, because how would you go and assign some metadata about the genre at the level of, not of the whole document, but of different parts within the document? Because uh, we have this model like a Ferber, now LRM, and other ontologies, but they're normally just 
um, about the you know, bibliographic data and the physical uh, editions or items. When it comes to content, I think we still don't have a good model for that, right? Yeah, th thank you. Th this is a very, very important, important question. And, and I mean, the, for me, this is the kind of, the, the way that I've been trying to think about it is that, like, we've got very, we've got new methods that we are trying, for example, this genre detection and, and thinking about that, how do we implement it? So we can think that, that in the same way that we can have a, like a rolling window and, and see what, when there is a sequential genre change, for example, in a book. But, but then if I'm thinking about it, that what do I want to get out of this so that also other people can use it in some other context, not, not just that we're able to do it, for example. So that when does it become the kind of metadata that should be somehow controlled uh, and then given to other people so that they can take that also forward or just rely on that and work with it, right? So, so that there, I mean, that, that what we then, what we started from thinking that, okay, the rolling window way of thinking about the genres, for example, would be the best way. But then it actually for the th idea that we do some kind of experiments with the data itself, and then move towards the idea that, okay, here's now some kind of a metadata or bibliodata that can be used in the kind of old, more old-fashioned way. So there we realized that, okay, we, maybe we don't want to do the rolling window type of thing, but we want to look at chapters within the books. And, and, and there, if we could classify things so that we, we systematically give for a couple hundred thousand books that, okay, here are different chapters and here's the sort of a probability for that particular chapter of being some genre, I think that that then becomes the kind of metadata that I could give to others in the same way that I can, for example, offer them information about place of publication or, or something like that. So, so that, but, but it's the negotiation between uh, what is useful and what is not that I think is the very interesting part. So for example, for, we've been working with Ferber model, we've been this text, text overlap question and, and the question that when, how can we identify additions uh, and, and say, make a sequence of that we have a work and then other additions coming out of that. Uh, for that, the text reuse possibility of, of looking at the overlaps and identifying uh, additions in cases that where we don't know. There are, there are some books that we know very well that have critical editions. But then you have a whole lot of material where you don't have that kind of information. So, so but, but using the, the methods that we have and then thinking about what of that information is such that we would like to classify it so that we offer it in a way that we have uh, in bibliographic sort of a normal library cataloging. Uh, so so that, that coming, coming to that border and making those decisions maybe together with people from other uh, domains would be the one that, that I, I'd be very interested in. And I think that there's a possibility of doing some very sensible work together. But not all of the experiments and, and all of that work that has been done with the full content is such. And not all of the uh, questions that we are asking are such that where you would need the biblio information either. I mean, that you can do, do things, of course, with uh, text themselves that you, where you don't need the metadata in a way. Okay, thank you, Mikon. Nanet would like to comment. May I remind ourselves that um, the Biblio data was in the first place not created to do any research with it, but with, for cataloging. And that's also why we are now missing this kind of information. And we think about ways how to add it and how to bring those both concepts together, like um, the perspective from the libraries for them, it is probably still useful to, to rely on Mark, and for us, it is a problem. And also, um, to find a way how to combine this, um, I just wanted to um, point out on, on a survey about um, what metadata do we need as, for example, doing um, 
uh, text collections in, on, on genre, authors, uh, works, whatever. And uh, if you look in the, in the app uh, of the conference, you find the link to the survey um, about um, metadata, in this case for literal scholars. But um, with this kind of information, we, we need to get, as Dorota said, um, the user requirements. If I'm looking for genre information, um, I will be completely um, yeah, lost in a catalog because it's just not there. But if we find a way of what kind of information do the scholars need, um, then we can, then the next step, uh, go to the libraries and um, uh, work together on, on adding this kind of information. Okay, no, no, if David would like to comment. No, no, okay. Okay, so another question from the audience. Okay, please. Yeah, hello, um, I'm Ulrike from uh, Berlin or Potsdam um, and I um, I'm new to your channel, uh, channel panel. Oh my God, is a, I wasn't feeling so well yesterday. Um, it's it's really very interesting to hear what you are doing, um, and I have like two questions. So um, first of all, um, I find the, the Wikidata approach very interesting. Um, it's something I haven't thought so much about. Um, that it could be useful to replace something so, uh, that, like Mark, um, which I also hear this ongoing joke that it's dying for several years, but nothing so far has been happening. Um, but I also attended a um, Wikidata workshop on Tuesday where we were just able to, you know, um, change all Wikidata um, entries there. So I'm wondering how this goes together. Uh, is it more with the, with the quality or it's it just a really um, a question. I don't know how it works yet. Um, and uh, what would interest me also as a research question is that also in your scope, um, uh, how to make like citation networks. Um, so it's, I don't know to whom of the group these are, but you said ask us whatever you want and I took the liberty to do so. I'm very curious. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So maybe the Wikidata question will be yeah. definitely for David. Yeah, thanks for the question. No, uh, Wikidata won't replace Mark. Now, Wikidata is a platform where you can publish your semantic triples uh, in, in a quite an anarchic way. No? So uh, you can do, as, yeah, uh, to some extent, uh, what you want. So this is also the critics towards the, uh, Wikidata that um, there's no strict model to follow. There are recommendations, of course, and now we have entity schemes which tell us that the property you are using is not the favored one. So um, if you use your own Wikibase, you don't have this problem because you define your model and it can be 100% uh, compatible to uh, Bibframe or Ferber or the LRM, which is not the case for bibliographic data on Wikidata at the moment. No, there are ongoing um, community discussions. So uh, you won't have your library catalog directly on Wikidata, but maybe on your own Wikibase or some, some other um, linked open data database solution. Uh, the good thing about Wikidata and the reason why um, all the use cases we have been uh, in touch so far want to be compatible is the uh, identifiers, no? so that you can have, for example, federated queries from within Wikidata for more detailed information about the same entity somewhere else or the citation links now, because the cites uh, property is just one property. There, there, you, though, there you don't have a chaotic situation. You have always the same property for the citation link now. So if you have two identifiers and of publications with one citation link, that is, that is what, you, what you want and where everybody can contribute now. So this is, this is the... This is the good thing. And also, for, of course, for any other kind of entity, you have descriptions which uh, are not present in any library catalog no? about persons or the relations of the persons and so on and so on. Okay, thank you, David. Any other comment to the Wikidata question? If not, uh, please, if we can ask you to repeat the question number two because we have here intensive discussion. <laughs> what was this <laughs> question about? Um, 
yes, um, of course, there were a lot of uh, questions or two questions. Um, the second was, um, um, are you also researching into citation networks or are the works um, that you are uh, doing um, and the different approaches you are presenting also um, en enabling um, that? Because that would be something that, uh, uh, that interested me. Okay, now understand and the floor is open for Giovanni. Yeah, so I can take this one. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, indeed. So we have primarily spoken about citations as a means to do uh, citation chaining or information retrieval, but indeed there is a lot of interest in using citations to analyze how um, humanists uh, use literature, use the sources, and uh, you know it's very related to bibliometrics essentially. There is a whole subdomain there that is interested in the arts and humanities. Um, and so we also think indeed that um, some of the projects that we mentioned can contribute to that uh, stream of work because Again, one of the main lamentations that we have there is that we don't have enough data, and we don't have comprehensive data. So it's always a challenge, contrary to other disciplines, to do citation network analysis in the humanities. So you need to put a lot of work in creating your network in such a way that it's comprehensive. Um, but I think us uh, and, and, and many others have done quite a lot of work in that respect. Uh, so I'm happy to, to tell you more later on if you're interested. Anyone else? Okay. Start. Thank you, Johnny. Anyone else would like to comment? If not, next question in the audience, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, panel. I was wondering, uh, I'm Draho Meratsupar from the University of Zadar, Croatia. So I was wondering about um, um, user needs. So, when uh, you were talking about unstructured uh, part of the biblio data, uh, I had in mind, uh, for example, book historians who are dealing with uh, very specific uh, book descriptions of a rare book or manuscripts uh, or any other uh, type of um, uh, old books and uh, rare materials. Uh, most valuable data are actually in library catalogs unstructured for book historians. How do you think uh, this problem can be tackled in a bibliographical database? This is one part of the question. And the other part, uh, speaking of unstructured data, uh, is uh, could this also be um, applied to the broader GLAM community? So archival descriptions uh, or uh, museum, uh, or, or, I don't know, catalogs or whatever. So do you think about expanding or applying this to the GLAM community? And uh, how <laughs> can we deal with uh, unstructured data, which is really, really valuable to users uh, in this context? Thank you, so maybe question for Miko. Yeah, well, I, I think for others too, but, uh, <laughs> but, but so, so from my perspective that, that this is something that we've been thinking quite a bit. So we, when we started working on something that we called uh, bibliographic data science, our idea was that we just want to have tools where we can, contextual tools, th th those were the ones that we wanted to bring uh, to the fore with the idea that uh, I'm interested about more particular things, uh, I need to be able to contextualize that. So, so let, very simply saying that a lot of people say that Shaftesbury was one of the most quoted people in 18th century. People say this kind of things, but they don't have any idea what they are. It's based on anecdotal evidence. So, so for example, then if I have, have different kinds of this kind of contextual tools coming from the biblio data so that I can actually say that, okay, there were this many editions that were, were printed uh, during the hand press era, so we can say that this was actually a popular author. So, so this was the idea. But then, I mean, that I, I think within a few last years, things have changed so that, that we are not only taking the, the library data, like Nanette very well pointed out, that wasn't meant for research. 
but, but, but then you can do all kinds of things with it when you're thinking what do you need. But then things have really changed that, that you can take the full text, you can take all kinds of things and create different types of entities out of it. And when it comes to the needs of book historians, I, I, I think that, that a lot of the, what is still lagging is that we don't know what people actually need. So, so sometimes the book historians, for example, that are not doing uh, computational approaches themselves, they, they are maybe not aware of what could actually be done. And then it's not communicated what is needed. So, so that, that, that's where, where there's a bit of a gap. In humanities, often it has been that the idea always, like when it comes to metadata, that these metadata categories are not describing my objects in a right way. So we need to create a new scheme, which is not necessarily the best way of getting something a bit larger done. So, so, so that, 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 that's something that, that more communication uh, is needed and then there can be solutions that are more fitting to new, new ways of, of, of thinking about. What was the second question? Sorry, I... Oh, the glam, yeah. So, yeah, very much so. So, our, we, in Finland, we've been developing Darjev Finland, uh, where one uh, part of the project is on, on metadata uh, and, and working with it. And the idea is that, that we would broaden, especially thinking about visual culture and also the museums uh, and using the metadata that we get from, from different I mean, there's so many archival collections and, and then thinking that what can be done. Of course, that there are, the, like I, when I was talking, I, I said that the li libraries are great. I mean, you can say bad things about Mark, but, but there's a lot of good information there. So the museum collections, as they have been catalogued, are sometimes a bit more problematic in a way, that, that, that the detail of information is not, not necessarily such that it translates as easy to research. But uh, at least we are working with it, and I think that that's a very, very important uh, idea to think about the metadata as a, as a research object and, and then going beyond libraries and, and especially the GLAM, GLAM sector uh, at, at large. Okay, thank you, Miko. Nanet would like to comment. It's already on. <laughs> um, yes, about the unstructured um, data. If you think about metadata or bibliodata in specific, this is a very high structured and thankfully high structured data. But on the other hand, we have the um, results of mass digitization. And there, it doesn't matter if it's uh, text or visual or whatever. Um, so GLAM uh, sector would be included. And uh, the result of that is messy OCR results and so on. And if you find um, ways um, to, to um, extract structure out of that in an automatic or computational um, way, like uh, Miko pointed out uh, for his research, um, then the next step would be how to give this additional information back to the to the catalog or um, to the to the biblio data in the end, and how to enrich it and make it. Um, yeah, if we can't structure the mass of data we get out of this um, mass digitization, then we probably can extract information from that and uh, add it to the existing biblio data. I don't know if that answers <laughs> your question at all, but. Okay, so maybe I will try to add a comment from my side. Uh, I'm curating at my department Czech literary bibliography, so that means specialized bibliography for literary science, and we are trying to add uh, the specific type of information which should be important for a literary scientists or literary scholars. That means information about the pseudonyms and ciphers and cryptonyms and so on, but these are basically available only in the form of the string. So we are trying to at least take this information inside the string and then convert it into the separate field, so the people can, uh, you know, query the data and, uh, and uh, make a query for the, for the cipher of pseudonyms. So that's the thing. We expect that the user might 
needed. And just maybe the last voice. I think that uh, uh, regarding the um, book history and all the rich descriptions of the text and how we want to structure it, so I think that we don't have to think only about relational databases, so it only comes back to the original database and so on. So it is a little bit easier of a concept to think about when you think about like knowledge graphs, for example, right? And then when we see, have before, uh, in front of our eyes, the text, and it's annotated with information, right? Then we start to think about digital editions, for example, right? So then we enter into another, like the barrier between metadata and editing, uh, uh, annotating the text and how we can represent it. And we have the tools for representing the, the different parts of the text with structured information. We have more and more available and easier and easier to use tools to do that. So then the boundaries between the metadata and textual analysis are a little bit blurred, which is a, a good thing uh, in the end. So I think that the, uh, looking into the knowledge graphs way of thinking about databases is one of the solutions to think how, how to go forward, which doesn't solve the problems in an original data source, but maybe it doesn't have to. You know. So that's for me. Okay, thank you, Tomek. Another comment from the panelist? If not, if not, there should be a question, and there is a question. <laughs> thank you so much for this inspiring panel. Um, I've been working on the German National Library catalog for five years now, and um, extracting like translations, finding and extracting translations are very tedious and complicated thing to do apparently. And I observed that each time when I was uh, extracting that, of course, the catalog looked com like my data set, resulting data set looked completely different. And that's due to this kind of like cataloging practices that are very different and there's this delay of cataloging. So I was just wondering in general in bibliographic data, uh, working on bibliographic data, how can we account for changing cataloging practices? This kind of longitudinal question is really like always at the back of my mind. How do I account for that I'm only, uh, like that this data set really only represent, represents, that I have only represents a momentary snapshot of the catalog, but there's like practices that are might be changing that are like not so visible to the researcher either. So it always required like a close collaboration with people from the German working at the German National Library to really understand what's happening. What what? Um, so I was just wondering how you see your work kind of going through accounting for cataloging practices and how we can kind of think about it in a longitudinal, like from a data perspective. And then I had a more technical question also for David Lindemann. I was just wondering what your experiences are in linking the Gemeinsame Normdatei with the Wikidata entities. Um, yeah, is there like a possibility? Do I have to repeat the question? Yeah, there's some echo here, so if oh. you hear that, yeah. I was just wondering what your experiences are in linking the Gemeinsame Normdatei with the Wikidata entities of persons and places. The first question is for, uh, for everyone. Yes, probably, um, I'm not <laughs> I don't know if I know more about that, but um, maybe about the, the first question, which is basically a, uh, about timestamps of the extracted data set. And there won't be a solution for that because if you think about how big the ecosystem is, how many people are working on the catalog simultaneously all the time. So if you extract your data set, it will be necessarily different uh, probably an hour later. So the only thing I would, from a pragmatic point of view, recommend is to um, yeah, give it a timestamp and do your research and then republish it as a research data set um, with an expla 
explanation saying, yeah, that is what is my research based on, and it is from that and that day, and um, and then you 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 kind of you can publish it together with whatever other data you created, and you have your um, background um, secured to to refer um, to your research results. That's only a pragmatic um, way to see it. And about the uh, gemeinsame norm that I, <laughs> um, and there is no relationship between Wikidata and the GND. Um, but um, I, as the GND gets more open, <laughs> I would say, there are these um, agencies uh, also in the national research data um, yeah. infrastructure um, now coming up. So um, there are also studies about um, comparing what is in the GND and what is in uh, Wikidata. And um, I hope the, in the future it gets more, it gets richer and more open for researchers to contribute to um, GND, and the question is, do libraries, um, yeah, do they consider their own resources like GND uh, more reliable than Wikidata, for example? And, and what is the um, point of view of the researchers? Do you rely rather on Wikidata or GND? What's the difference and so on? So that, those are, it's all a, a series of questions I would go, give back to you. <laughs> but uh, just, oh, yeah, no, just one sentence. The, the, the mere linking of identifiers is relatively trivial, no? So this is not about models, it's about linking entities. So it's not that complicated, no? To, to link persons from one place to, to the other. And if you look at Wikidata, you have the GND identifier, the ORCID, the VF, the other one, the other one, uh, any authority file, and they are there. No? So it is actually, it is, this is why the paper aside calls it the identifier, because it's like a central pillar where all the links, you can find all the links, no? Just quickly about the translations that, I mean, we've been working between <coughs> English 18th century and or British and, and, and French translations, and you can't trust one source, you can't ESTC and BNF, you can't connect them directly with respect to translations because the titles change, so you, you, you don't know if that's, that is correct. So, so for example, what we've done, we try to be as creative as possible, just think that we need all the possible data that there is, so there's like one 1960s catalogs of material translated from uh, French to English, so we digitized that ourselves and, and then connected a uh, very hard process, but in the end uh, mapped that to ESTC IDs, uh, where then we ended up with just one more column in our CSV that says that these are translations. <coughs> so it's not, not en en everything, but it's, you know, we can work with that and, and, and then also mapping between Gallica and, and the full text of, of Echo uh, and, and coming up with translations from there. So, you know, it's spread out. But, but one data source will never give you everything you need, no matter how national library it is. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much for your question and for your answers and because we are running slightly out of time uh, I would just like to ask Tomek for the closing remarks and for the closing words and in between I will try to distribute our our report and uh, if you would like to yeah there should be one question in a chat we would most probably answer it after the after the session or do we still have time um, I think so yeah so if so, we would have time, we can ask or... Okay, um, so there's one question from Daniel Kienitz. Um It's for David. Um, how good is Wikidata in terms of authority control in regards to duplicates? Have you checked it? Um, if so, um, if you have two to three identifiers for one and the same en entity, Wikidata seems or, or is useless. So have you checked that? 
Sorry, I didn't understand well the question. <laughs> um, how good is Wikidata in terms of authority control in regards to duplicates? Have you checked that? Uh, no, that was not, not part of my work, but in practice, so to do it systematically, right? But in practice, um, that has not been a problem so far. The problem has been that uh, some people don't still don't exist on Wikidata. So if you create a person, you should add, uh, add as many identifiers as, as you can so that you can make sure that it doesn't exist already. And of course, uh, we, we check whether an entity also, uh, already exists when, when, as soon as we use it. Um, and uh, if you find duplicates, you just merge them. So. That might happen, yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, David. And uh, we are wrapping it up. We started five minutes later, and <laughs> we are finishing five minutes later. Uh, so thanks all for attending. And we have the next steps for our working group and our panelists and so on. So the first thing is we will have a October Open Bibliodata Workflows Book Sprint in Prague. And we will deliver to the shock open marketplace new workflows related to Bibliodata. But also what I wanted to invite you to and to get in touch with us because we are planning a cost action related to the topics that we have discussed right now. So if anything is interesting for you, if you find any, any topics interesting, you want to work with us, with the panelists and other working group members, just get in touch with us during the conference or write an email to me or to Wojtek that you would be, we want to be a part of the network that we are building and we are very happy to accommodate anyone uh, that wants to work with us and help your projects scale up, help in multidisciplinary collaboration, streamlining existing activities. So we are exciting to collaborate with, with you all uh, in that. So thanks, any, uh, thanks again for your participation and enjoy the coffee break. And thanks.